Hello and welcome. My name is Meeplus, they, she, he, and this is Literally Graphic. And today we are jumping ahead to look at my September slash October TBR because as I've mentioned once or twice already, I've decided to continue my recently developed tradition of taking off September because all the things always seem to happen in September. That said, the trouble is largely on the video side and I suspect my reading will continue largely unabated, so I am biting off a bit more than usual. I will probably live to regret this, but seize the day and all that, Well, I am happy to get back to outlining my monthly TBR before the month actually happens. Starting out as I usually do, let's talk about the first manga. Kicking stuff off, I'll be talking about some number of volumes of the original Fruits Basket series by Natsuki Takaya. Currently I'm aiming to read them all, but we shall see. There are a lot of them. Not the kind of series I would generally pick up these days, but it was one of the first manga series I was handed as a kid and I never finished it. It was really depressing how hard it was to get my hands on manga back in those days. Anyway, for the uninitiated, the first volume is summarized thusly. Quote, After a family tragedy turns her life upside down, plucky high schooler Toru Honda takes matters into her own hands and moves out into a tent. Unfortunately for her, she pitches her new home on private land belonging to the mysterious Soma clan, and it isn't long before the owner discovers her secret. But as Toru quickly finds out when the family offers to take her in, the Somas have a secret of their own. When embraced by the opposite sex, they turn into the animals of the Chinese zodiac. End quote. A widely read series. What are y'all's opinions? The eyes are certainly very big. Next up, as I already revealed in my TBR for this month, I'll be trying to read through Full Metal Alchemist by Hiromu. Arakawa, another early -ish manga series to me. I did finish this one and it's been a favorite in the back of my mind for a decade. Based off of some of my reading this year around Japan and World War II, I'm interested to see if it holds its place or loses it on this revisit. Might even fit the original anime in for comparison. The summary is, quote, in an alchemical ritual gone wrong, Edward Elric lost his arm and his leg, and his brother Alphonse became nothing but a soul in a suit of armor. Equipped with mechanical auto male limbs, Edward becomes a state alchemist seeking the one thing that can restore his and his brother's bodies, the legendary Philosopher's Stone, end quote. And because the layout of the, the weeks, we have another three manga month. Yay! So last but certainly not least, I hope to tackle Talk to My Back by Yamada Murasaki. This series was originally serialized in the 80s, but has only now been translated and published by Drawn and Quarterly in English for the first time. As soon as I saw this on my library's new acquisition page, I knew I had to pick it up. The summary is, quote, set in an apartment complex on the outskirts of Tokyo, Talk to My Back, 1981-84, to explores the fraying of Japan's suburban middle-class dreams through a woman's relationship relationship with her two daughters as they mature and assert their independence, and with her husband, who works late and sees his wife as little more than a domestic servant. While engaging frankly with the compromises of marriage and motherhood, Yamada remains generous with the characters who fetter her protagonist. When her husband has an affair, Chiharu feels that she too has broken the marital contract by straying from the template of the happy housewife. Yamada saves her harshest criticism for society at large, particularly its false promises of eternal satisfaction within the nuclear family, as fears of having been thrown away inside the empty vessel called the household gnaw at Chiharu's soul. Yamada was the first cartoonist in Japan to use the expressive freedoms of alt manga to express domesticity and womanhood in a realistic, critical, and sustained way. A watershed work of literary manga. Talk to My Back was serialized in the influential magazine Garo in the early 1980s and is translated by Eisner-nominated Ryan Holmberg, end quote. Moving along to my queer comic picks of the month, I'm aiming to give Wovable Oaf by Ed Luce another try. I picked it up a while ago and I don't think I was in the right place to appreciate it. The summary is, quote, Wovable Oaf is the first ever collection of the acclaimed self-published comic book series by cartoonist Ed Luke. Oaf is a large, pursuit, scary-looking ex-wrestler who lives in San Francisco with his adorable kitties and listens to a lot of Morrissey. 
The book follows Oaf's search for love in the big city, especially his pursuit of Eiffel, the lead singer of the black metal queer core progressive disco grindcore band Ejaculoid. Luke weaves between the friends, associates, enemies, ex-lovers, and pasts of both men into the story of their courtship. A romantic comedy at its core, Wovable Oaf recalls elements of comics as diverse as Scott Pilgrim, Love and Rockets, and Archie, set against the background of San Francisco's queer community and music scene. End quote. My second queer pick for October is Fuck Off Squad by Nicole Gao and Dave Baker, a book I tried to read and review this past year, but whatever month it was, I remember that I fell greatly behind with my TBR and ended up needing to cut some corners. Quote, Fuck Off Squad by Nicole Gao, Murders, Gem in the Holograms, and Dave Baker, Action Hospital, Suicide Forest, is a graphic novel that follows three would-be miscreants as they attempt to navigate the trials and tribulations of growing up in Los Angeles. Needless to say, it's the greatest comic about Instagram skating and low-key trying to date someone while you're still in a relationship ever made. After this, we'll only be two reviews away from my next A to Z of Queer Comics Lit video. So that's nice. My indigenous pick for the month is Dakota Warriors by Cole Balls, as my library has finally picked up a copy. Some of you may recall I reviewed Pizza Punks, also by Cole Balls, a while back. Very fun. Dakota Warriors is described as, quote, a young person growing up in Haynes Junction, Yukon. Artist Cole Pauls performed in a traditional song and dance group called the Dakwada Dancers. During that time, Pauls encountered the ancestral language of Southern Tishoni. Driven by a desire to help revitalize the language, he created Dakwada Warriors, a bilingual comic about two Earth protectors saving the world from evil pioneers and cyber Sasquatches. Pauls' elders supported him throughout the creation process by offering consultation and translation. The resulting work is a whimsical young adult graphic novel that offers an accessible allegory of colonialism. Dakota Warriors also included a behind-the-scenes view into the making of the comic and a full-color insert featuring character illustrations by guest Indigenous Canadian artists. End quote. My anti-ableism pick for the month is The Third Population by Arlene Caudray and Jeff Porquet, a translated work as well, which makes it doubly interesting, really. The summary is, quote, founded in 1956, the French psychiatric clinic La Chazine is an open and welcoming facility that houses about 100 people of all ages. It provides traditional forms of care for people with serious mental illness, but it does so in a uniquely supportive environment where patients and caregivers participate equally in the day-to-day -day operation of the clinic. The driving force of La Chesne is The Club, a nonprofit organization serving as a liaison between the clinic and the outside world. It arranges cultural and recreational outings for the patients as well as activities like concerts and exhibitions that bring the public to La Chesne. As a result, days at the clinic are quite lively and never routine. Author Arlene Ducadre and illustrator Jeff Bourquet immerse themselves for a time in the culture of La Chesne. Like everyone there, including the patients, supervisors, and caregivers, they took part in the daily chores of the clinic, cooking and cleaning. They participated in group events and even led a comic workshop to teach the residents about their craft. The third population is the engaging, inspiring, and often poignantly funny result of this project. The second translated work was a bit more of a random pickup. I don't remember where I first came across Life of Che, an impressionistic biography by Hector German, Oysterheld, Alberto Breccia, and Enrique Breccia but I think it was somehow related to simply browsing my library. I feel like there are a couple of graphic novels about Che, so I suppose I'll need to read them all in the next few months for some compare and contrast. This one seems to have the most distinct art style, but we shall see. The synopsis is, quote, Life of Che is one of the most anticipated entries in Fantagraphics, the Alberto Breccia Library, Originally released as part of the graphic biography series in January 1969, it came out in Argentina only a year after Ernesto Che Guevara had died and reached an audience beyond comics readers. In the 1970s, the military government raided its publisher, destroying the means to reprint the book. The comic was presumed to be lost to history until a publisher in Spain restored it in 1987. It has never been translated 
into English until now. The book begins in Bolivia in 1967, then flashes back through Che's life, his childhood, his radicalizing motorcycle trip with the Alberto Granado, his taking up of arms in Guatemala, his meeting with Fidel Castro, and his subsequent military and political maneuvers, ending in a fade out to his death. Alberto Breccia and his son, Enrique, drew Life of Che. Enrique draws the Bolivia passages in a woodcut style, while Alberto depicts the flashbacks in his trademark expressionistic black and white. It is primarily set in the field and with the people. Hector Germain Osterheld, the Eternaut, lends his authorial voice with Che's first person. Life of Che is imbued with a sense of immediacy as both Che and eventually Osterheld would meet their ends by a military government backed by the American CIA. As Pablo Turns writes in his afterward, it is the testament of someone consciously marching towards his revolutionary death, end quote. Next up, we have the next entry for my abortion comics read-through. This time, I'm picking up I Know You Rider by Leslie Stein. Check out my playlist of all my previous picks. The summary is, quote, a candid and philosophical memoir tackling abortion and the complex decision to reproduce. I Know You Writer is Leslie Stein's ruminations on the many complex questions surrounding the decision to reproduce. Opening in an abortion clinic, the book accompanies Stein through a year of her life steeped in emotions she was not quite expecting while she also looking far beyond her own experiences. She visits with a childhood friend who just had twins and is trying to raise them as environmentally as possible, chats with another who's had a vasectomy to spare his wife a lifetime of birth control, and spends Christmas with her own mother who aches for a grandchild. Through these melodically rendered conversations with loved ones and strangers, Stein weaves one continued conversation with herself. She presents a sometimes sweet, sometimes funny, and always powerfully empathetic account, asking what makes a life meaningful and where we find joy. Amid other questions, most of which have no solid answers, much like real life. Instead of focusing on trying I Know You Writer is a story about unpredictability, change, and adaptability, adding a much-needed new perspective to a topic often avoided or discussed through black and white lens. People are ever-changing, contradicting themselves, and having to deal with unforeseen circumstances. Stein holds this human condition with grace and humor as she embraces the cosmic choreography and keeps walking, open to what life blows her way. End quote. My black comic to read this month will be another long one, namely Black Panther by Christopher Priest, the complete collection, volume four. The final volume of Priest's work on Black Panther. Next up, we will have Reginald Hoodland's run. The summary for this final collection is, quote, Christopher Priest takes the Black Panther in a whole different direction, with T'Challa gone, who will inherit the mantle. Could it be the guy with the trench coat and guns? Kevin Casper Cole is seeking revenge on the people who hurt his family, and it will bring him into conflict with corrupt New York policemen as well as a brutal hunter. It's the all-new Black Panther versus the White Wolf as a crime novel in superhero comic form begins, but nothing in, priest, in a priest tale is ever black and white. End quote. Should be interesting. And to conclude, last but certainly not least, earlier this year I was gifted I was gifted a Ballad of an American, a graphic biography of Paul Robeson with text and art by Sharon Rudall, edited by Paul Buell and Lawrence Ware. It's been a very long minute since my last Rudall read, namely A Dangerous Woman, the graphic biography of Emma Goldman. Needless to say, I am very excited to read more about such an icon. The summary is, quote, the first ever graphic biography of Paul Robeson, Ballad of an American, charts Robeson's career as a singer, actor, scholar, athlete, and activist who achieved global fame. Through his films, concerts, and records, he became a potent symbol, representing the promise of a multicultural, multiracial American democracy at a time when, despite his stardom, he was denied personal access to his many audiences. Robeson was a major figure in the rise of anti-colonialism in Africa and elsewhere, and a tireless campaigner for internationalism, peace, and human rights. Later in life, he embraced the civil rights and anti-war movement with the hope that new generations would attain his ideals of a peaceful and abundant world. Ballad of an American features beautifully drawn chapters by artist Sharon Rudall and a compelling narrative about his life and an afterward on the lasting impact of Robeson's work in both the arts and politics. This graphic biography will enable all kinds of readers, especially newer generations who may be unfamiliar with him, to understand his life story and everlasting global significance. End quote. And that's all they wrote. What will you be reading while I'm away? I've been binge watching nostalgic TV shows, so I have fallen very far behind on my YouTube consumptions. Apologies. 
Buy it all, keep reading, and organize to end capitalist oppression. And as always, literally graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.